it's a large problem. It's not an orphan disease. A lot of people and probably very un underestimated. So finally, companies are getting interested. Um, took a long time. Under pressure of other interest groups, the whole research was really blocked 15, 20 years. And uh, since last year, it's just changing. And, uh, I think we finally come to a stage where we, we get some funding. But all the research you will be seeing was either funded by my clinical work because I don't get a salary from, from my clinical work. It goes to the research I'm being paid by the university. And, um, or it was paid by private investors. But nothing ever came from the government or from any other uh, pharmaceutical or other industry. Um, in 2007, there was a conference in um, Norway, and uh, one of the leaders of the ME Association there uh, told me that there were 83 totally bedridden patients there with a Karnofsky score of 20, 10 to 20. That means they were lying in the dark, could not move anymore, and the maximum they, they could not talk, speak, they could blink with their eyes, and just could do this and answer with their fingers but could not move up arm or wrist anymore. And uh, they had made an inventory. They have 83 patients like that in, in Norway. So I, I, I got back, it was in October. I discussed this uh, with my colleagues. And finally, in, in March, I went down there to see. And I saw eight of those patients around Oslo and Lillehammer. And um, I, I uh, was quite shocked. And the guy who was with me just uh, uh, had done his medical studies, he just had his diploma. And after that, he stopped medicine and st started studying engineering. Uh, he, mm -hmm. he, was, he was so shocked seeing this uh, that he, he said, I cannot handle this. And he, he went into engineering after that. So, um, it, it was quite bad to, to see those patients being helped by their parents and nobody taking care of them. They seldom saw a doctor. Uh, if the doctor came, they made prescriptions, but they didn't see the patients. Mm -hmm. and, and so they, they were not looked after. So they were extremely disabled, and I was very fortunate to be able to see those patients because uh, it's from then I learned more than from all the others combined <coughs> in the past 15 years. Uh, I decided to do my own personal study in 20 to 23 of them and, and, and do blood work and, and do a no number of things, observations and see what it does and finally I, I uh, reduced it to uh, uh, five which I followed very intensively. I was successful in three, I was not successful in two and uh, three out of uh, actually uh, four out of six, um, because it's one family with three children. Um, mm. I got four out of six out of bed, and, and two are studying again. One is traveling all over Europe, and, and uh, the third one, Lillehammer, she received uh, a Volkswagen from her friends, and she's driving around with it now. In two, I was not successful. I'm missing something. Uh, I don't know what I'm missing, but maybe. There is something neurological destroyed, which I cannot make up anymore again. I don't know. I don't know if I could ever get, get them back to... I kind of ended this project because I cannot uh, ever spend every weekend in Norway. Uh, it's, it's impossible. So I kind of gave these, uh, these two patients back to, to their GP, instructed them. It's a GP who has uh, some background in immunology. So I have still contact with him, but um, it's not looking too good for these patients. So I compared those patients with moderately ill patients, Koshi core 60, 70. That means 60, 70 you don't work, you can take care of yourself. Uh, you maybe get once in a month go to shopping, uh, but uh, it's, it's not a, a great life, lifestyle or great situation. We took contact controls, uh, family and non-family contact controls, and completely 
non-contact controls, people have never seen NME patients, never been in contact with them, and so uh, completely non-contact controls. The parameters we studied in the beginning were a, a, a bunch of viruses, uh, because uh, at the time in 2007 8 it was said that AG6, EBV are important players in the onset of the disease. Borna virus has been named as a cause, and then uh, we did both antibodies and PCR, which is 6 and EDV, but we didn't find any significant results. We didn't find anything, and these were analyzed independently in foreign laboratories in the United States and in uh, Germany, and in fact, they got blind samples uh, in, from, from these four groups and really didn't see anything. So, all the previous research regarding uh, EBV and HV6 uh, uh, and Borna virus, we really questioned them uh, with, this, with this thing. But what we found, I started looking at the gut, uh, got interest in 2007 in the gut, and I measured LPS. LPS is uh, part of the code of gram-negative bacteria, and, and these uh, gram-negative bacteria um, uh, could have in their code lipopolysaccharides, which are the most potent immune inductors that you have. If you inject a concentrate of a few milligrams of LPS into somebody, they die instantly. They go in shock and die. So it, it, it creates a huge immune shock, LPS, and you see that in people who are crushed, who their abdomen is, is crushed, or you see that you can get them back to life because they are in a state of shock uh, because of LPS. Now we looked at 22 patients with this low Karnofsky score, um, 29 with a Karnofsky score of 60, 70, contact controls and controls. And you can see from this slide that the green and the red ones are the patients. They have significantly higher um, LPS levels, lipopolysaccharide levels, in, in meaning that gram-negative uh, bacteria come into the bloodstream from the gut and um, then, then controls and uh, the contact controls and the, and the controls were not different at a mean of 6.4 and 9.7 picogram per milliliter. The uh, CVS patients were uh, significantly higher than the, than the controls, those with the um, Karofsky score more than 60 and those with the Karofsky score 20, 30, they had a, score, they had a level of 25.2 which is really high and if you compare that with the Nature Medicine article, which is published in 2006 uh, on HIV patients, uh, this is significantly higher. And some of these patients have uh, LPS of more than 100 uh, picogram per milliliter, which is uh, extremely high, and you don't find that in any of the AIDS patients they studied in that study. So it means it's, it's really very high. And so I got of thinking that it means that the gut barrier is abnormal in these patients. So that's the idea, that the gut barrier is abnormal. So uh, gram-negative bacteria, uh, which are uh, in fact uh, very dominantly present in the small intestine, uh, they penetrate more easily into our system and they give a chronic activation of the immune system. So a presence of the uh, LPS in bloodstream suggests a hyperpermal gut was also published in that same article Nature Medicine in December 2006 and LPS is uh, in increased is consistent with a lot of intestinal symptoms like nausea, poor appetite, gastric reflux, bloating, abnormal bowel, bowel motility and abdominal pain. But whether the LPS is directly uh, responsible for that uh, was certainly not true at the moment we did this study. And the most likely explanation of the gut permeability is linked to alteration of the intestinal microbial flora. And this is a study from Henry Buck, uh, uh, who looked at E. coli, Enterococcus, and Streptococcus. E. coli is the most dominant um, um, bacterium in the small bowel. And uh, you, as you can see, uh, between ME patients and controls, there is no difference in the quantities of these uh, bacteria in the stool. So there's, there's no difference. 
but enterococcus and streptococcus, which only represent less than 3% of the normal flora in the small intestine, um, we see the significant difference, and they are significantly higher, certainly streptococcus. Uh, in Europe, it's a little bit different. In Europe, we have more enterococcus compared to streptococcus uh, <coughs> patients. There's a little bit difference, um, but uh, they're both significantly increased compared to the controls. Regarding the anaerobic flora, the flora of the colon, we see that there's no difference uh, for bacteroides, which is the normal flora of the small intestine, 90% of the flora of the colon is bacteroides, but we get uh, an overgrowth of the more unusual, unusual bacteria, which are present in lower quantities normal, Prevotella, Bifido, and Lactobacillus uh, are uh, increased and uh, in, in our last studies, we see that also Clostridium is often uh, increased. Uh, the, um, the, the, the flora who normally makes less than 10% of the total colon flora in these uh, patients is, is significantly increased in, uh, in, in the patients in, in, in percentage and in absolute numbers. And so what we see is that the the gram-negative to gram-positive ratio in the small intestine is altered uh, in the patients. The gram-negative to gram-positive ratio uh, goes down significantly, meaning that there is an increase in the gram-positives, namely uh, streptococcus and enterococcus. And this is very significant. We go from 16,000 to 658 uh, in, in, in more than 100 patients. So uh, this is very significant. So uh, this is the kind of assay of our page you get, the results get where the, the, the bacteria are red. And enterococcus is related to symptoms we see in a knee, headache, arm pain, shoulder pain, myalgia, palpitation, and sleep distress. Uh, all not with uh, too high R values, but this is uh, caused by the fact uh, that there is a big dispersity in the normal flora and this is not very homogeneous there's, there's a lot of differences between people and and so the R values are not that high but the correlations are all significant for streptococcus there is a, a strong relationship with post-exertion fatigue which is a very important symptom in, in the knee photophobia, mind going blank uh, the, the lymph glands and you know that the gut has lymph, that uh, in fact there uh, is lymph in the gut which directly uh, has contact with the tonsils, with the lymph in the throat, so um, the, the cervical uh, lymphodynia, the swelling of the glands, is, is, is certainly something that could be related to streptococcus. Also palpitations, dizziness and faintness. Now is this direct effect of the bacteria or from their toxins? Uh, this is not clear from this study, but we'll, I'll comment on that later. So, uh, Henry Butt from University of Melbourne did some studies on the lactate production of these bacteria, Enterococcus faecalis in, in vitro, uh, measured with NMR, uh, produces uh, more and more lactate when uh, they're incubated longer and longer. You see with time that lactate production goes up. Lactic acid bacteria, the bacteria, uh, both streptococcus and enterococcus produce uh, lactic acid. Also, some anaerobes uh, produce, of course, lactic acid. When you look at all these bacteria, you see that there's a correlation with mental fatigue, photophobia, urinary frequency, urinary urgency, palpitations, dizziness, and faintness. Again, uh, there is no um, clear um, proof that it's, it's, it's by the lactic acid that these uh, symptoms occur because these bacteria produce also other toxins. So we started looking at hydrogen sulfide and hydrogen sulfide is one of the most potent toxins that exist for humans. It has important physiological functions because in our brains we have hydrogen sulfide in very limited amounts. Uh, because it's an important place number of neurotransmission 
It plays a role in regulation of blood pressure, in muscle relaxation, and in regulation of inflammation. And so in, in very uh, low quantities, iron sulfide is some sort of a neurotransmitter uh, and a muscle relaxant uh, for smooth muscle. But exotic, it's similar to nitric oxide. It's different from that. Because, yeah. It has cumulative functions. Uh, some functions like um, the vasodilation of, uh, and, and effects on, on smooth muscle are the same. Uh, and of course, nitric oxide will also vasodilate the big vessels in the brain and, and will poten potentiate iron sulfide, which does the same thing. If you have effect on smooth muscle, the blood vessels will, will be uh, involved. And also in muscle relaxation. Uh, in excess, iron sulfide is a mitochondrial poison. Uh, it directly inhibits enzymes that are involved in the production of, uh, of energy. And in fact, it uh, inhibits strongly the last step of the prep cycle uh, just before you go to water and CO2. Uh, CO2. Uh, you have an enzyme uh, that, is in, that is inhibited by this iron sulfide. It also interferes with oxygen transport by blocking hemoglobin in the red blood cells. And so other stuff will bind the hemoglobin and you will get some sort of uh, desaturation. That means that hemoglobin is not uh, saturated for 99% but less. And we have measured this in patients and it's, it's, it's down. So iron sulfide is a potent neurotoxin. Uh, each year farmers die. Uh, hanging over their uh, waste pits they have, they throw eggs in there and so on and you get sunshine and rain and everything starts fermenting and they come too close and they die instantly. You get in fact a total block of the respiratory and cardiac center in, at the brain stem level and 800 uh, particles not, uh, is, is enough to, if you inhale 800 particles at once, uh, you die immediately. And in, in uh, um, that got, parts per million or no, no, just eight, just 800 particles. If you inhale, you know, 800 particles, you're dead. That's, that's, that's enough. With 27 particles, your eyes start burning, and this is a very common symptom in in me patients uh, when they have eaten a few times uh, during the day that their eyes start burning, uh, and and that's because of the hydrogen sulfide. So. Enterococcus, Streptococcus and Prevotella, so twee, two um, aerobes and one anaerobe, but uh, Enterococcus and Streptococcus are facultative anaerobes, they can also adapt to anaerobic metabolism, they are strong hydrogen sulfide producers. So we developed a test to measure, in fact, the metabolites of hydrogen sulfide in the urine. And a strong uh, color change within three minutes uh, is really, uh, in fact, indicative that there is a lot of hydrogen sulfide metabolized within your body, not within your gut, but coming from uh, the, the bloodstream and then in the urine. And in all 22 or 23 patients that of the severe cases, it became immediately black. Like I tested it out in, in these patients, so within 10 seconds, uh, it was uh, like on, on the right side, it became immediately totally dark. And uh, so we knew for 100% there was a correlation between uh, the activity of hydrogen sulfide, the amount of hydrogen sulfide in the body, and the severeness of, of the illness. Uh, because there was no exception uh, that immediately happened. And so this also correlates with the higher permeability of the gut. Um, so, and if you also have bacteria, that produce more hydrogen sulfide, and you have a perfect explanation why this uh, would happen. Now, uh, in these patients, we also find mercury and other metals uh, in the body, uh, silver, um, um, nickel, and, 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 and copper, mainly copper. And we see that the other um, uh, metals like um, selenium, the antioxidant, is, is low. And, and we do this by giving a chelator IV and, and we look then at the urine two hours later and we see that the output of uh, especially mercury and nickel 
and copper is very high in these patients. And I'll come back to that later because this has important consequences. Now, um, I like this slide because uh, it's a slide made by uh, our colleague Christine Metzger. She's a, a, a German uh, PhD that works at our lab and she's pretty good at visualizing things. Now, um, what we think and what's probably happening is that Streptococcus and Enterococcus molds and fungi while producing hydrogen sulfide um, are in fact overgrowing in uh, these patients and uh, E. coli is present there too but what happens is when they overgrow uh, more hydrogen sulfide is made so if more uh, if more bacteria are there and uh, they uh, they will create a more lactic acid uh, milieu E. coli doesn't like lower pH and E. coli will, will die off more, will, its metabolism will be reduced and so we get less E. coli and more of these other uh, bacteria and fungi. Now this hydrogen sulfide comes into uh, the, the gut and the bacteria uh, in the gut they don't like mercury and nickel and other metals that come into our food and uh, when these metals come in to our food, they will produce more hydrogen sulfide. So the amount of hydrogen sulfide that is produced when these bacteria, who already are more in quantity present, when they are uh, in contact with, uh, with certain heavy metals, which kill them, they will try to make a complex of a, of a metal uh, with, uh, with another organic molecule so it does not is not toxic for them anymore. The problem is that it becomes toxic for us. So if you have more and more hydrogen sulfide produced, and then it's also toxic for E. coli. So both the lower pH and hydrogen sulfide are toxic for the metabolism of E. coli, which is an aerobic bacterium, purely aerobic bacterium, and it's toxic to their mitochondria. So. The other bacteria, they can switch to anaerobic metabolism, they're facultative anaerobic like uh, Enterococcus and, and Streptococcus, so they can adapt to that uh, situation. Now when there's a lot of hydrogen sulfide present, the metals I just mentioned uh, will bind with the sulfate and with uh, a methyl group and you get a di di dimethyl sulfate metal and uh, these are the metals that are extremely toxic for all cells. They kill cells uh, and they are extremely toxic for neurons. They're not only toxic for the gut because in fact they, they're going to create uh, holes in the gut by destroying the digestions between the cells and they will destroy certain enterocytes. So they get in into the body very easily. And um, so both the iron sulfide will then flow in because you have a higher permeability and also these toxic metals, organic, so we, we made from an inorganic metal, we made an organic metal and this organic sulfated methylated metal will come into the body. Iron sulfide uh, will be accompanied by other, media, other uh, mediators like NO and CO because these bacteria also make nitric oxide and they will also uh, produce CO. CO, which has a bi higher bending affinity for hemoglobin, uh, will then bind uh, all the places on the hemoglobin which are not uh, bound by oxygen, so if the oxygen is not fully saturated, then CO will find a place on that. So oxygen therapy could be useful? We use oxygen, but I'll tell you what the dangers are too. So we use oxygen therapy in certain instances, but it, it can also be extremely dangerous. You can get a respiratory arrest and death, sudden death with it. So it's, it's not without uh, any risks. So um, hydrogen sulfide is directly toxic to, to the mitochondria because it, uh, it has an effect uh, on their uh, uh, internal walls and systemic. It also will reduce their uh, capability of making ATP by interfering with the Krebs cycle.
So there's already one reason why there's less ATP in the cells. So the, the, the effect on the, on the mitochondria, so cells who primarily do aerobic work uh, will in fact make less ATP. So we become more dependent on anaerobic metabolism in, in our cells. The second thing is that um, this uh, compound, this organic metal, uh, that would be uh, mercury or nickel, um, is a very toxic substance directly for mitochondria also. So it, uh, it, it will go through the walls of the mitochondria and will sit in the mitochondria and will inhibit a number of its functions. And the third thing is if you have a lot of those uh, organic metals, they will become a source of misfolding of proteins. We have, and uh, the name is probably not very well chosen, we have proteins sitting on the outside of our cells, which are called prions, and, and prions are also used in a negative uh, way because we, we think of mad cow disease and, and so on. But um, these uh, prions are PRPCs, and uh, these prions, they take their shape, their three-dimensional shape, by putting in metals like manganese or others. They, they go into this metal and you get a three-dimensional structure by binding sites uh, where the positive ions, metals, are in and they will bind with negative bindings in the protein and you get a three-dimensional structure. So if you get a wrong metal in uh, such a protein, you will make a other type of, uh, of protein, a PRPDC, and we call them aberrant prions. These are not the usual prions, and they lose their function. So up till five to ten years ago, there was very little research on what the function was of the normal prions, but the normal prions seem to have a very protective role to the cell, uh, entry of viruses, and so on. So if you have these aberrant prions on your, uh, on your cell, they mainly are going to um, lose a function, a protective function on the cell, and they're also toxic for the mitochondria by a mechanism I'm going to show. So all these uh, mechanisms, these three mechanisms, lead to an, uh, uh, a, a loss of ATP, and as you can see, when you start with this mechanism, you have some ATP loss in, in, in the beginning of disease. If this becomes more and more, you have more mitochondrial dysfunction. And finally, in severe cases, you have more and more of this mechanism coming in and it accumulates. So you have less and less energy. And um, I've seen patients who've been, in fact, in a body bag where the, fa the, the, the family took them out because there's still some respiratory uh, activity, there was still some damping on the mirror, you know, after five minutes, they, and, 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 and they, they took them out again. So, um, the, the metabolism of these patients is completely down, completely reduced, and uh, you can explain it by this kind of mechanism. So, what do heavy metals do? They interfere directly with the energy production. You need copper to activate an oxidase, uh, extracellular and this complex uh, with uh, uh, thiols on, on, the, on the right side, copper and an oxidase will then activate a CoQ10 in the plasma membrane and this CoQ10 will intracellularly activate through NADH the Krebs cycle. So this is what normally happens. You will make ATP uh, by a series of events uh, where an oxidase, copper, thiols uh, cookie 10 and Krebs cycle are involved. So I can show this again. This is what happens in normal situation. Okay. So, what happens if mercury comes in? Mercury will, in fact, uh, stop uh, the uh, the whole thing at level of copper. It will intervene uh, in some some special way. Uh, by interfering with the effect of copper on these uh, two enzymes, uh, thiols and oxidases. And what you will get is the reverse effect, ATP will flow out. So instead of, of, 
of producing more ATP, you will get reduction of ATP. And that is what, what these heavy metals that come in through um, hydrogen sulfide into the body, that's what they do uh, at intercellular level. They will suck out uh, ATP in, that is being produced and, and, and it goes the other way. Also, we will have more free radicals. We have a, a, a destru destruction of the double uh, SS bounds of the, the sulfate bindings. And for example, in insulin, there are two of those bind bindings. So it may, it may well be, this is a hypothesis, that the insulin res resistance we see in these patients is because the insulin is partially uh, dismantled, is destroyed, and, and cannot exert its normal function. So, we see a lot of uh, pseudo hypoglycemias in these patients, and, and this may be one of the mechanisms. Could that be the same with thyroid hormone resistance? No, thyroid hormone resistance is something else. Uh, there's no sulfur involved in, in that, uh, that molecular level. But thyroid hormone resistance is because on the T3 uh, resist, uh, receptor, uh, there is some protein of the RNAs activity. Uh, present so a false uh, two five day synthetase uh, a stereotype. If you put you make two more two five day synthetase, you all uh, you always will make is a stereotype, and and that's inactive. But that will also that has a high homology with the T three receptor. It will bind the T receptor so then no T three can in fact uh, will bind. And so we diagnose this by measuring T three and T four in the urine. Normally you have more T3 than T4 in the urine in normal people. Reverse what you find in the blood. And here you will find that there is less transformation of T4 to T3 because there is no demand. This demand comes by the number of free receptors for T3. So, also the, uh, the making of, of, of uh, oxidants like uh, proxy nitrate, Martin Paul's proxy nitrate. So he says this is the only cause of all chronic diseases. Uh, I, I find it uh, difficult to accept. It's one of the mechanisms in, in this disease, but we have a lot of production of proxy nitrate, and proxy nitrate is the strongest oxidator we have in our body. And so as we produce more NO already in our body, we will, uh, in fact, uh, go, we're going to stimulate the production by superoxide uh, to uh, proxy nitrate, O and OO negative, and that's one of the strongest oxidizers of our cell membrane, and it really gives more damage to organelles and to um, cell membranes. So the end result is that, uh, given the other mechanisms, there's a, a lot less ATP uh, produced. And in fact, this is, um, if I talk about alcohol intolerance, this is also the mechanism of Alton Tart. The, the membranes, the ATPase has to work five times harder. Uh, and uh, to, to get this thing rolling, to get enough ATP, and uh, alcohol blocks the pump, and alcohol blocks the, the sodium ATPase pump. So uh, a system that is already under stress will then be blocked and, and so uh, you get more and more anaerobic metabolism and a lot of uh, ME patients say when they drink alcohol the next day they have uh, an enormous hangover. Well, uh, the hangover comes by massive production of lactic acid uh, because you have no other way to, to produce uh, ATP. So regarding these uh, aberrant protein, uh, proteins, prions, but they, they can exist by genetic mutation. They can exist by environmental, uh, by heavy metals, people who work in mines and exposed to, to, to metals. Uh, they can one day uh, produce uh, these uh, aberrant prions. And uh, this is some mechanism that's involved in the development of cancer because these brands take the energy of immune cells, I mean, you are going to have more chance to get in cancer. And, and so this is being studied in other labs, we, we don't do that, but this is being studied, you find a lot of publications on that, because everybody's interested now, today, 
in these abnormal proteins and cancer. But in our uh, case, it's an acquired uh, abnormal protein because uh, the proteins that start to reproduce on the outside of the cell and need to find a metal uh, are overwhelmed by mercury and, and copper and other uh, metals like nickel and at a certain moment uh, one of these metals will fit in into the into the what we call a mold of a of protein three-dimensional structure and you will get an aberrant prime because it will make a different conformation and then what happens is that uh, we can measure this now yeah, I can say there's this type of uh, aberrant proteins very easily uh, so uh, on the bottom line you see the aberrant proteins in luminescence uh, they behave very uh, different and you can see in 15 minutes we can see whether in urine or saliva people have aberrant proteins uh, because after only a few minutes you see a totally different response in a luminescence and this is a proprietary um, technique uh, Chris Ruland uses and nobody else in the world can do this right now the laboratories that for research uh, do this kind of assays uh, measuring amounts of aberrant proteins it takes them three days to do that and so here it's done in less than 15 minutes you can just measure in saliva and I can tell you I have patients with, whose saliva contains up to 9,000, 10,000 aberrant prions per milliliter of saliva so enormous amounts of, of aberrant prions when you get older you shed more normal prions so it's normal that in urine of older people you find more normal prions but the aberrant prions which behave differently in luminescence and are easy to measure uh, in this technique um, you can in fact um, see very easily and so what happens is that you have a cell with normal uh, proteins I don't call them prions uh, and one day uh, the uh, protein will make a mistake and it will take the wrong metal there will be sitting one aberrant protein in that cell and these proteins they have an abnormal mold and they they copy themselves so through messenger RNA you get the same structure and only that new metal will fit in so if you keep on feeding these new met these uh, aberrant uh, or a lot of mercury and other things you get more and more of these aberrant proteins and so finally the cell will get more and more of these aberrant proteins and uh, the normal functions of these these proteins will get lost and in fact we will pull out more and more ATP out of the cell instead of uh, producing it so um, regarding uh, the hydrogen sulfide and then going to from moderate disease or a pre me uh, situation because we with the hydrogen sulfide test we see that in a lot of uh, patients in the family members there, there are people with uh, hydrogen sulfide production in urine uh, sometimes rather severely but they don't have a leaky gut yet and so uh, we see often al already an abnormal fecal test and high hydrogen sulfide but these people do not have uh, ME and they have no fatigue they often have like IBS and when you exercise them and uh, uh, an American researcher has done some uh, research also with my twins uh, my twin patients where one of the twins has ME and the other doesn't and and she never picked up really on this and she published that the twin brother of this uh, or twin sister of these patients uh, also when they were identical twins mm -hmm. had uh, a VO2 max which was lo much lower than the normal population in fact it was closer to the the, the patient in, in value than to the normal people so if the normal value was 30 milliliters per kilo uh, the patient had 19 and the brother of, or sister had 23 so, they, they, she, she, she already found out that uh, patients uh, in, 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 in twin situation have a low VO2 and have a slow recovery than, than other people. So there must be something present, some uh, uh, pre-situation which is already metabolically compromising uh, people before they get the ME because they're perfectly healthy uh, 
people, you know, they, they have no symptoms, real symptoms, maybe some, some IBS, but for the rest they have no, no symptoms. And so, uh, these people are investigated and often are treated with probiotics uh, and they get somewhat better. The people with moderate disease, let's say, Karnofsky score between 70 and, 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 and 90, they have an abnormal fecal test, high iron sulfide production, and they also uh, are exposed to heavy metals. They have fatigue, gastrointestinal symptoms. We stir the gut with probiotics, enterocotic antibiotics, and once they are at a level that the gut is normal, we chelate them if it's necessary, uh, and we give zinc and other stuff just to uh, replenish and other things. So we have good results with not too aggressive uh, things uh, in this group. It's only in the third group that it becomes difficult. Uh, in the severe disease, they have an abnormal fecal test, high iron sulfide. The, the, the body is exposed constantly to heavy metals. And we have some aberrant protein conformation. About 20% of uh, the, the ME patients have this aberrant conformation. Uh, and they have strong fatigue and multiple symptoms. These patients are more difficult to, to restore. Um, and here we have to do the right sequence of things. We found that these, these patients have often um, casein intolerance, they have fructose malabsorption or lactose intolerance. That's some pre-existing uh, thing that's responsible for the malfunctioning of the gut in the pre ma patients also. And so we have to do that very carefully and find out what the pre-existing problem was in order to then restore the gut uh, and, and afterwards chelate and look at the immune system. But there's an extra problem and this is the immune dysregulations. When we go from this group, like Konofsky score of 100, to this group here, which has a Konofsky score of 20, which are these uh, extremely bedridden patients, we see that the immune dysregulation becomes more and more uh, severe. We get depressed T cells. And for hydrogen sulfide, the CD8 cells and the NK cells that are depressed, we get a TA17 activation and I don't know if it's, it's from this slide, but we found that there is uh, some genetic abnormalities in uh, people from Scandinavian origin or from uh, British, uh, Scottish, uh, Irish origin that have some mutations, some point mutations, T17, that make it much more active. If you have a longer time, a high active, highly active T17 immunity, your TH1 goes down. <coughs> TH1 is responsible for clearing viruses, for clearing mycosis, and for clearing intracellular bacteria uh, as Rickettsia, Bartonella, uh, Borrelia, and also for parasites. So gut parasites also are an issue. Uh, most of our colleagues say people get blastocystis in Thailand, you don't have to do anything about it. Okay, if you, if you stay normal, you don't have to do anything about it, the body will take care of it. But if you have a deficient uh, TH1 immunity, uh, you are sometimes going to have a problem with these, uh, these parasites because they start producing certain chemicals. And there's a nice overview article, a very thick article, of what all these parasites do. They further depress TH1 in the gut. Now, 80% of all our immune cells are in the gut. If you inject 50 million stem cells and, and you mark them radioactively, uh, then the next day 40 million are in the gut. They will not become lymphocytes immediately. And, and, and Cheney is doing this right now with a few people in, in a country where there's no ethics approval necessary in, in, in Panama and in Costa Rica. And he's giving people stem cells and he sees that after a few months their gut uh, becomes again normal and the symptoms disappear. A lot of people rather severely ill become normal but honestly, I think, uh, first of all, 2% of these uh, stem cells contain leukemia cells. Uh, they're from cord blood. And, um, and, and in these countries, they're certainly not selected. You know? and, and secondly, if you don't take away the basic cause, uh, the cause of this all, these, these stem cells will last and, 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 and they will wrap out to lymphocytes and so on. They last three to four years, but the, the, the game will start over again. 
you get an infection, get, and, and this thing start going again once your TH1 is down to a certain level. So if you look at TH1, TH2, we see that TH1 gives protection against intracellular pathogens, TH2 gives protection against extracellular pathogens, and, uh, and TH17 is responsible for the local immunity, mucosa and skin, and protection against fungi and bacteria. And we see which cytokines are in fact uh, responsible for the induction from naive T T0 cells that are just coming and uh, just ripening out from, from the stem cells uh, towards the different things. IL-12 is, is responsible for TH1, uh, IL-4 is responsible for TH2, and TGF-beta and interleukin-6 are responsible for TH17. So what happens in, in this disorder is that in fact, when you decrease TH1, the then you get, in fact, uh, <coughs> low CD8 activity and low uh, NK activity. Uh, you, you, you get that with dysbiosis. And in the same instances, when you get a TH1 degradation, it allows an increased TH2 and TH17. So if you are going to have less movement in this direction, you have more, more uh, uh, movement in this direction, certainly we get some low-grade inflammation, uh, which IL-4, and inflammation also related to IL-6. TGF-beta is probably also related in um, the, um, um, the exposure of molds. So if you expose to molds, it's one of the things where TGF-beta is high, you will also wrap out more TH17 cells. So in normal situation, TH17 cells are only a few percent of your total TH cells. TH1, TH2 is, is in the gut in balance in women. In men, it's about 70, 40, 70% 70 TH1 and 40% uh, uh, TH2. This also explains the difference in, uh, between women and men in the uh, occurrence of the disease. Because before menarche, there are just as many boys and girls who get ME. After menarche, it goes up to 4.3 to 1 and 4.7 to 1 uh, women uh, to, to men. TH17 is also uh, uh, related to autoimmune disease. And, and so a strong induction of TH17 uh, uh, favors the, when you have the genetic predisposition of the uh, uh, onset of autoimmune uh, diseases. Um, so when you get a TH1 decrease, it favors development of obviously viral infections, and we published on that. We found that the powerful virus B19 is significantly different between uh, uh, controls and, and ME patients. There's a lot more powerful virus in the gut. So when we measured a million cells from stomach uh, mucosa, and, and we go a little bit down under the mucosa, we measure much more powerful virus copies with by PCR than in, in, in normal people. Also enteroviruses published by HIA and uh, herpes 6 and, and Epstein Barr. And so the gastrointestinal mucosa is a major site of infection. And when your TH1 is, 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 uh, is low, and, and again also we see that there's lower gastric acid uh, uh, production in these patients, uh, we see that there's more uh, favorable situation for uh, these viruses to go in and stay there. The TH2 increase in patients uh, uh, favors development of allergies. TH2 induces the humoral uh, immunity, so the antibody response, the, the B cell activation, and in first instance we see that uh, a lot of patients have high B cell activity, they have a lot of antibodies, they make more antibodies against EBV and CMV for example, although they might not have more EBV and, and CMV in their body. It's just because the immune system is, is activated. And, and so uh, you get more allergy, you get more overactivity of the immune system uh, because TH2 is related to immune, uh, the humoral um, immunity. TH17 increase uh, promotes inflammation, autoimmunity, but also the blood barrier, blood brain barrier disruption. And, and so about 25% of uh, ME patients have higher than normal protein values in their spinal fluid. 
uh, some have more herpes 6 and so on. Uh, so the uh, blood-brain barrier disruption is also activated when you have a lot of uh, TS17. So something we always measure is the uh, amount of TGF beta and interleukin 6 because if these are high, we know that they can be an important neural component from uh, blood brain barrier disruption. And if they, there are neurological symptoms, we do a spinal tap. Because you might find an infection in some patients, we find chlamydia and other things. And, and so then we do a spinal tap. If the TGF beta and IL-6 are normal to low, there's much less chance that you're going to get uh, in fact, these neurological symptoms uh, uh, as a consequence of, uh, of uh, an overactivity of TH17. So we, 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 we can do a lot of measurements, but we have to make some choices and we make some strategic choices to uh, get a better evaluation of the patients and, and their treatment, possible treatment. So, what we also published is this genetic background that we find in certain populations. We find polymorphisms of IL-17F. The TH17 was named uh, after interleukin-17, which was, of course, uh, discovered after interleukin-16. And instead of calling it TH3, uh, these, these guys wanted to publish uh, at TH17, and everybody in the world accepted this, uh, which is not logical, because normally we would have called it TH3, but uh, it's now called TH17. And uh, polymorphisms of IL-17F, uh, IL-6, TOL receptor 4 and TGF genes are associated with ME and other intestinal diseases like Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis and IBS. So these are all genes that are in fact upregulating TH17 and upregulating of uh, uh, TH17 leads to downregulation of TH1 and in fact more autoimmunity and disruption of the blood-brain barrier. Now the case for XMRV, I don't have to put much slides up for XMRV because everybody's been overwhelmed by this, uh, by the virus that is now uh, next month, uh, uh, well, in October, uh, six months that they've been talking about this, this virus. And um, what is XMRV? It's an infectious gamma retrovirus. It, it's called Sinotropic Marine Leukemia Virus Related Virus. And in fact, uh, it was uh, uh, discovered by Silverman in prostate cancer of men who have no RNA cell activity. So, in, in men who have a genetic deficiency in RNA cell who cannot defend themselves against viruses in the prostate. And so, it was discovered in 2007. And, and so, at, a, at in Reno, um, uh, Dan Peterson uh, did some study, uh, and I was there at a time where um, pooled blood of 22 patients and 22 controls uh, was sent to NCI for a total uh, genetic testing for 5,000 viruses. So pooled blood of 22 patients you know, and 22 controls, match controls, and it's very expensive research. And so when we compared the two groups, there were only seven viruses, uh, ten viruses different between two groups. And there was no human virus in there. There was no herpes 6, there was no EBV between the two groups. Just what we found with the Norwegian patients, there was no difference in between those two groups. None of the human viruses made any difference between those two groups. Mm -hmm. And they, they, uh, out of that came ten animal viruses. Nine normal viruses and one retrovirus. But N, uh, NCI gave a wrong labeling on the retrovirus. They gave it one of the other retroviruses. And, and so XMRV was only discovered in ME uh, in 2008 and published in 2009. Uh, because, in fact, in 2005, it was made a mistake. And only when comparing the virus with the virus from Silverman, it was shown that it was identical. Okay? So, uh, XMRV is not limited to, uh, to this disorder. And you can go two ways. You can think all these patients, because of their gut pre-existing diseases, have a low TH1, so they will be getting this virus easier. They cannot get it out. And if, if they write that 4% of Americans is infected, 
it's, it's logical that you find a higher uh, amount of these viruses in, or higher incidence of these viruses in immune depressed patients. But again, it could play a big role in the, in the knee because it's immune su uh, suppression virus. It suppresses Th1 further because it has uh, a love for B cells, for T cells, and for NK cells. So, and it also likes uh, tissues that are rapidly uh, growing, like intestinal cells that are dying off every five, six, seven days, and and, and are responded. They are a possible source where they find, in fact, in fact, their basis to grow. And it was first isolated for prostate cancer. In the report that was made first in Science last year, it was shown that 67% of these patients had. Um, XMRV versus 3.7% of a double number of controls. Uh, in, in the meantime, um, four papers came out showing no XMRV, n no, not none in the, in the controls and none in thing. That means that they cannot find it. Okay? Because if, if in this study 3% of the, of the controls have it and you don't find any uh, in your study, and you don't find any in the, in the other patients, that means that, in fact, your methodology, and that methodology is very difficult on blood, because blood is not the place where this virus hides. It's a tissue virus. So it's in, in, in blood there are no rapidly uh, growing cells, so it's logical that you don't find a lot of this virus in, in blood. So in fact, what, what's being done now, especially treated cells, uh, type of cancer cells are injected with blood serum of patients and then they let the virus grow by culture and culture is the only golden standard in microbiology for in new virology for discovering viruses uh, if it grows in, in vitro in, in, in these cells it's there it's, it's present in the body and, and, and the PCRs and the antibody tests they, they will come out in the next months maybe weeks um, but they are much more difficult because we talk about such a low load of virus in the peripheral blood. And um, so, like other retroviruses, co-infections with other viruses like Kripa-6 may be an important issue. And as you know, in the Lake Tao epidemic of 1984, there was a new variant of HV6A uh, uh, discovered, a new variant of HV6, the, the virus we have in Europe and, and also in Australia and Japan is herp, human herpes 6b which is the cause of roseola infantum the fifth disease in children and everybody gets it before that you're three years old and you get infected and sometimes you're not even sick of it but a new variant from Africa which probably came with AIDS because uh, in Africa 70% of the children are human herpes 6a positive uh, they, uh, there was almost no B in the U.S. before 1984. So all these patients in the Lake Tahoe epidemic, uh, there are about 400 people that became chronically ill after a viral infection, they are human herpes 6A positive. And, and, and so these retroviruses uh, also come often with human herpes 6. Uh, and um, what we think that happened here is that the people around Lake Tao uh, that got sick, 9% of the population there, um, had low levels of um, antibodies against uh, human herpes uh, 6b. And, and they got infected by human herpes 6a together with other viruses. And it caused a much bigger infection than normal because, uh, in fact, human herpes 6a is 13% different in in uh, genome than human, six, uh, human herpes 6b and, and if you have no antibody titer, uh, if you raise the loan, if you don't go to schools with a lot of people and so on, a number of people have no antibodies. Uh, although it's very rare in our population, most children have been infected, um, there is in fact uh, the possibility that they got a much broader basis of infection brought in other retroviruses and, and, and so got, in fact, uh, this, uh, this epidemic going. And 
it was probably an epidemic related to human herpes 6, but the retrovirus came in at the same time uh, because uh, retroviruses like HIV also like very much human herpes 6a and come in at the same time and grow at the same time. So the research is being done. There are probably more than one type of XMRV. There are more than one the subtype. Some subtypes will be more aggressive than others. So uh, it is a mouse virus and it's uh, like 95% the same genome as the mouse virus. Uh, it's just mutated. Uh, there, there are some changes in that thing. And there's going to still be a lot of discussion where this virus came from, how it got mutated. And there's a lot of speculation around. I'm not going to comment on this. But uh, it's going to be an issue, a medical legal issue, uh, where this virus comes from and, and what it does to people. So, um, in patient evaluation, we look for H2S production. It gives us a good idea of correlation with symptoms. An intestinal microflora evaluation, heavy metal analysis, looking for proteins with abnormal conformation. That's what I do in Belgium. And we look at uh, immune dysfunctions, immune dysregulations, opportunistic infections, and so on. Because if you have like a chronic mycoplasma infection, it becomes part of the disease and it becomes part of pathophysiology and you have to treat it. Uh, mycoplasma fermentans, for example, is an oncogenic mycoplasma. It induces cancers. Uh, is this also related in, in, uh, in Crohn's disease? It plays a role as aggravating factor in, in, in Crohn's disease. So you have to look for these opportunistic infections and, and if necessary also treat them. So my conclusion is that gastrointestinal dysfunctions play a central role in the pathogenesis of ME next to other genetic abnormalities, pre-existing uh, digestive uh, abnormalities like uh, undiagnosed uh, mild celiac disease, uh, lactose intolerance, fructose malabsorption and so on. Um, they lead to dysbiosis and the dysbiosis leads to an increased production of hydrogen sulfide. In a situation then where the immune system goes down, this hydrogen sulfide uh, will uh, penetrate the body and this will even increase the immune dysfunction uh, because of metabolic changes and we will get more and more immune dysfunction and opposite infections. And so once established, uh, these infections will continue or they will uh, in fact have an aggravation and maintenance of disease. So, um, in conclusion, I think that the gastro system uh, needs to be studied at a very early age, certainly in, in children, uh, in patients where the mother or father has uh, what we call today still ME. I like to uh, call it uh, gene disease, gut immune neurotoxic disease, because then you, you name the whole thing. It's maybe inappropriate to call it gene disease. But in fact, uh, you don't have tonus, so we can say gene without tonic. Uh, and patients have no tonic, they have no muscle energy, and, and, but uh, it's a bit uh, uh, negative comment, I think. But uh, I think that um, we have to give it another name, whatever it is, uh, because uh, chronic fatigue syndrome is just as stupid as calling cancer uh, chronic fatigue syndrome. It's, it's just as stupid. And, and, and there is clearly a pathophysiology which you can follow from A to Z in, in, these, in these patients. Uh, and whether the XMRV comes in or not, I mean, it may be that XMRV plays an important role in 50 or more percent of the patients. Uh, but um, in, in, in the patients who have complicated disease with the prions and so on, I personally think if you kill off the XMRV, whatever, with the drug, you're not going to be cured. I mean, the, the system has been going, so the consequences will become an important thing to continue the disease. And, and, and so even if you restore the gut, I mean, if you're full of heavy metals, if you're full of primes, you're, you're, you will lose the uh, flu-like symptoms uh, of the disease. But the, the muscle pain and um, the anaerobic uh, thing, the, the pain does not respond to any drug because it's ischemia and it's metabolic ischemia. Metabolic ischemia, does not, there's no drug for it. Uh, you can only see that the metabolic ischemia diminishes. And 
So what I didn't say is that a lot of this uh, lactate is D-lactic, D-lactic acid. We have no enzymes to break that down. Mm -hmm. D-lactate comes into a cell, it, it's toxic to the mitochondria, and, and you get a, a lack of energy because the brain uses uh, glucose as, as, as food, as energy. Uh, it cannot use fat, so it's, it uh, relies on lactic acid, L-lactic acid that we produce ourselves and, and, and glucose. And certainly in a state of low, low glucose, the body will take up more lactic acid. The brain will take more lactic acid. And in this instance, a, a big part of the lactic acid will be D-lactic acid, which is rubbish for the, for the cell. So you will get these pseudo-hypoglycemias. Your, your glucose will still be 75 milligrams per deciliter, so not really hypoglycemia but your brain will shout for getting glucose mm -hmm. because it's getting rubbish. It's getting D-lactate and, and you cannot use it. So if it's like 20% of, of what, what it gets is, is D-lactate, you have a deficiency of 20% of energy in your brain. And so this also, uh, not only the, the bad neurotransmission and so on, this also accounts for um, brain uh, dysfunction. And although this has not been researched in depth in, in ME, there's a lot of articles on D-lactic acidosis in diabetes and other uh, things. And you, and you go to the internet and you tick in D-lactic acidosis. And as a patient, you will say, oh, these symptoms I know. You see like nine or ten symptoms and they're, they're all in, in, in what we call today, I mean, you find them. So there, there, is, there is a, a part that is it's linked to D-lactic acidosis. And that further leads to a deficit in energy and something you cannot readily change. So by eating sugars, uh, often patients feel better a short time, but all these sugars will be converted to lactic acid because you have a low aerobic function. And so uh, you're feeding your bacteria that make mm. more hydrogen <laughs> sulfide and no NCO. So the next day you feel rotten because you've eaten pastry and sugars and so on and, 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 and they have yielded uh, in fact a number of metabolites <coughs> that, uh, that are just bad for you. So it's better not to eat them and in fact those patients who have low D-lactic acid production they feel better when they don't eat, they just don't eat. With the intracocal antibiotics <coughs> you use. Uh, what are you actually using and for how long? What sort of dose? We, we are not using them as an antibiotic. We are just using to reduce the local flora. And so the, the use is an off-label use. Uh, it's, it's, uh, we pack them in, into entry coated because they have to pass the stomach and the stomach is not normal in these patients. So it has to pass the stomach and it has to also be some slow release. Um, it has to go all the way down to the last meter of the, of the intestine where the worst problem is because there is a slow, slowing of the bacteria coming to the inner sequel valve. So at, at the level of the inner sequel valve, there's more bacteria. So we have to get that all the way down. If you take it in and it's absorbed, it comes into the body. It's, it's what you miss. So we make it entry coated. We're now doing research with four universities, pharmacology departments, to make antibiotics uh, coverage that stays three to four hours because often there's also slowing of, of, uh, of, the, of the stomach. There is gastric paresis and so on. So we have to calculate that we want these antibiotics only to open three, four hours later. And that's not easy because if you buy something entry coated now it's it's one hour uh, or more so with isotopes it's being studied to make new entry coating and and also to to make a second layer that is a slow release that it's not all released at one time so that's the one one challenge uh, well the antibiotics for enterococcus they're they're known they're, they, they, they are the ampicillins amoxicillins and, and these types uh, for enteromycin, uh, for metromycin, for the streptococcus, is the, the main one. 
and then if you want to use one that works on both of them, and, and also on, on Prevotella and on the others, vancomycin. Uh, when our colleagues hear vancomycin, they, their blood pressure goes up because vancomycin is related to the fact that it's maybe the only antibiotic that's still usable when you have staphylococcal resistant, multi-resistant staphylococci. But uh, in fact, you can say two things. First of all, we use them orally. There's not one microgram absorbed into the body. There's too large a molecule that's not being absorbed. And, and so the, there's little chance that even if the, the stool uh, contains uh, vancomycin-resistant bacteria, that they will get in somebody other of his body. That's one thing. Uh, uh, secondly, um, most of these bacteria, staphylococcus, are, resistant, are already resistant for vancomycin. And that's not our fault. That was five years ago. Also. So um, we, we can use it. I have no problem using it. The Americans also add gentamicin. I don't want to use them because that's nephrotoxin. And, and so uh, gentamicin, we, I don't want to use. It's a good antibiotic. <coughs> there has been a suggestion to use bacitrobicin. Uh, but uh, I don't want to use that either because it's also toxic for the kidney. So I don't want to use anything that's toxic for the for the kidney in the long term because if you get out in a reasonable thing, you know, get, get a Karnofsky score of 90-95 again, you, you, you are like you were pre your disease, then it would be a shame that you've lost half of your kidney function. <coughs> so I'm not, I'm not willing to do that right now. So but I use regularly uh, I also use azithromycin, but that's, for example, at the same time a mycoplasma infection. Okay? And then I use a mycoplasma, uh, azithromycin, and then you can even alter uh, entry coated and non entry coated. Um, so azithromycin is, in fact, um, um, does not really have to be entry coated because it's, it's shed into the uh, liver, comes into the gall and in the, in the gut again. So it does this. Uh, this entric, uh, liver, liver entric cycle. So it's not absolutely necessary, but if you want to have high quantities of the zithromycin in the gut, you have to entric it. So here the options are depending on what you find. So you're looking at two weeks, six weeks, 12 weeks? Um, uh, I'm using short times of antibiotics. Uh, first of all, I don't want to get resistance. Secondly, uh, if you wipe out the whole gut flora, you're going to have other problems. So we alternate. Uh, these uh, bacteria, these uh, antibacterial uh, compounds, seven days, ten days, five days, depending. Flagyl uh, for anaerobes, I will use it five days only because people are terribly sick. Uh, even normal people are sick of flagyl. Uh, these patients get very sick when you use flagyl, so five days is more than enough, and you kill off enough anaerobes. So um, we alternate this uh, every month, and we, the rest of the month we give probiotics depending on the type of probiotics they need. If the E. coli is low, we give, a, we give e, e. coli. If uh, the lactobacillus and bifidobacteria are low, we tend to give them. But in the beginning, I give mostly metaflor, uh, E. coli, a lot, because these patients are often depressed. And their depression comes from low tyrosine, phenylalanine, and uh, um, the third is the tryptophan. And that's produced by E. coli. So E. coli produces these three essential amino acids, which are necessary to make dopamine and, and serotonin. Mm -hmm. So this is the main reason why, if you have no E. coli for a long time, that these uh, SSRIs that we prescribe in massive amounts that don't work. And often they, they won't. They, people get worse when they take them because there's no substrate in the brain to work on. If you want to um, re-update blocker, you need serotonin. You know? Same for the uh, the, uh, the uh, normal peristaltis. That's that's uh, regulated by serotonin. So if you love low serotonin in the gut, then you're gonna have constipation, and you're gonna be constipated. You know, low transit. Uh, <coughs> we, at, we we take all these in consideration, and with with a bunch of parameters, we can take uh, a decision. What is the best thing for this patient? Uh, and, and that's we make a uh, <coughs> program a la tête du client, we say in French, you know, just for this patient individually. 
and so we, we have the same policy for, for every patient, but um, it's quite different what they get. And sometimes, uh, as you have seen with the prions, CoQ10, which is given a lot to patients, is toxic for them. They, they have less energy when they take CoQ10. But these are the people with the prions. So if, if you want to know if they, are, they have prions, you do a test with CoQ10, give them high dose of CoQ10, one gram or so, 8 to 800 milligrams. And if their energy levels go down next day enormously, they have prions in massive amounts. Do you think that Helicobacter has any bearing on this? Helicobacter is an opacistic infection. And, and uh, a lot of us carry Helicobacter without being sick, having no symptoms, and so on. So it, it also grows, it's an intercellular infection. It also grows when the Th1 immunity is down. So it makes part of the whole thing. And I see patients that are Helicobacter positive. Uh, in my Belgian patients, I measure it all the time. But uh, I, I think that the GPs here already have measured it in a lot of patients. Uh, I don't have to advise that. Uh, but uh, no, I mean, it makes part of, a, of an immune dysregulated patient, which has low uh, capability of eradicating these, these things. Yeah, I was just wondering if it alters the environment of the gut at all that affects these other things. It does very locally. It does very locally. It, it, it decreases, in fact, uh, HGL production. And that's why the reason why it induces cancer over, over the years. Mm. I mean, uh, if you have less HGL production and high protein content, you have fermentation, everything, you, you get a lot of toxic substances in your gut. What about antibiotics that are given to patients for, say, bronchitis or sinusitis, that sort of thing? Yeah, I mean, I think there will come a day that we, we will use them more intelligently. Uh, they, they, they're necessary for, for in certain instances. Uh, and then often they get some sort of uh, probiotics after that, if the, if the GP thinks that the gut needs to be uh, restored. But often they get the wrong uh, uh, probiotics. They get probiotics of which you already have too much. I mean, uh, it's it's uh, it's something that needs to be studied. No company has ever studied this. No. What, what the outcome is of their antibiotic, they don't want that. Because mm -hmm. they'll, they'll have to add something and say the antibiotic is bad because it, it, it destroys the bifidobacteria or the lactobacillus or the lactobacillus and the bifidos and the others. And, and, uh, and you have to add this thing after that. Then you will think twice to prescribe it. You will wait longer to prescribe it and, and and so on, so that will have an effect on their sales. So they're not talking about this. S scientists, universities do, but uh, this is not popular research. There's been quite a lot of talk recently about uh, the importance of fiber in the diet uh, to help the immune system. And it was <coughs> interesting to know if these people that lie in bed yeah. and they can only move their finger, they definitely couldn't chew food. But they get fiber. They get so they get uh, the fiber uh, in, in in special. They get tube feeding. They all get tube feeding, and they get some have a, a gastrostomic uh, tube, and they get tube feeding, and they get what normal coma patients get, and there are fibers in there. Mm -hmm. so, I mean, it's not all pre-dissolved food. They get fibers in there. Mm -hmm. so, but fibers are important because bacteroides, uh, the the main anaerobic bacteria in, in the gut, needs fiber and to, to grow and, and so if you don't have enough fibers you lower your bacteroides and then Clostridium and the other bad bacteria will start taking their place. Do you think that the embryological uh, consequence of an excessive number of neurological cells and immunological cells and, and, and endocrine cells being present in the gut is a coincidence that your hypothesis of intestinal dysbiosis is one of the major you know, causes of MECFS. Do you think that's just a coincidence? Not a coincidence. The, the, the gut is the largest barrier of our body, and the immune cells should be there where, where the, the barrier is. You know? just, be, just behind the barrier should be the immune cells. It's, it's the soldiers that, that see what comes in and regulate what, what comes in. If you take uh, 
the gut and you cut it open and you take an iron, it's as big as a, <coughs> as a football field. So, I mean, the, the amount of cells you need to regulate that is, 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 is very big. So it's not a coincidence and uh, we have the local endocrine cells that produce the local hormones to make the, uh, the system work. But what I want to say is if you have a pre-existing um, fructose malabsorption, um, 50 years, 60 years ago, my parents, they tell me, we, don't, we didn't eat that much fructose. We got, we got sweet things from fruit once a week. And, and now people drink their orange juice every morning. So if you take two glasses of orange juice, already 80% of every person who, whose origin is Norwegian, Swedish, Finnish, uh, Northern uh, England, England and Irish, they have too much fructose, they can't absorb it. Because we don't have enough, these people don't have enough GLUT5. GLUT5 is a transporter which selectively takes up the, the fructose and puts it into the blood. Okay, and, and so uh, glucose goes to GLUT2 and GLUT4. And, 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 and GLUT5 is selective. So if you, if you think that the diet has changed in the last 40 to 60 years more than the last 1,000 years, in, in the Middle Ages and, and, and the Vikings, they had meat, they shot, they had fat, they had, um, they had fish, uh, they had a little bit of things they could grow in the short summer. And they had like a summer of three to four months, but they had berries as the only source of, of, of things, but they had no strawberries because that's cultured later. Uh, they, they, they didn't have any bananas with a lot of uh, uh, fructose in it and, and things. So they had maybe 10%, 15% of the fructose that we have today. The Africans have always had the fruit. I mean, they had the climate for the food and, and, and they always had the fruit. So it, your, your origin uh, and in, in two generations it's not going to change. Maybe in three generations our genome is going to adapt 5% or so, but, but not 80%. And so, um, I blame the Americans for a major part of their meat in the Western world. Because after the war, they made us eat corn derived products, Coca Cola, corn syrup, everywhere there's corn syrup. And you, you can't imagine what it is. They did a study in the US, so I'm not talking about the Europeans, and they, they found that 50% of the uh, corn syrup uh, and the a fructose syrup that's used to add to different things contains mercury. So um, there's a lot of things that have changed in our food and those processed food um, and, and that's not beneficial because we don't eat what we are. We, we eat food that is not fit for us. It, it tastes good, they put more fat in it, they put more sweets in it, it tastes better and, and they've changed our taste buds but uh, We'll have to go back to our Viking uh, origin and, and, and see that we eat uh, like them. And, and maybe with that a little bit, but uh, <clears throat> not long from now, and I, I'm, I'm, I'm working on that, will there be a gene test for GLUT5? And you will see how deficient you are. So you will be able to adapt your food to your own genome. And that's the major thing. 66% of Norwegians has, in fact, a fructose malabsorption. Just two-thirds. And, and, and uh, <clears throat> if we look at our studies, we're doing in Norway, Spain, and Belgium, because it's good to sp Spanish and Mediterranean, they have lactose uh, problems. And in Belgium, it's mixed. And in Norway, it's, uh, it's casein and fructose. So it's, it's fairly easy. To, to, to say the difference, see the differences. You can also see the, the different bacteria that they grow there. They adapt to what you eat too much, but you can digest. So um, the, the difference in Enterococcus and Streptococcus and Provotella and so on growth depending on your on your malabsorption and your maldigestion. So I mean, it's all connected. It's, uh, for me, there's no doubt anymore, and. We, we, we came out with this research last year because we wanted people not to go in the hands of psychiatrists when it was not needed. Mm. And, and that was the main reason to come out before it's published.
but right now we, we, talk, we do a big study and we get data from Melbourne, we get data uh, from uh, Oslo, from Lillehammer, from Brussels, from Madrid, and all pool them. And we come out with results in 500 patients and 1,000 controls. And what can they say then? I mean, it's, it's from five different sites. Uh, uh, nobody has influence in that. And, and, and each site puts in 100 patients and 200 controls. And, and, and you have a, a big study. And, and, and the numbers are there. Everywhere. Sorry, I just missed. What's that study you're looking into? Well, we're looking at hydrogen sulfide. And in another study, we're looking at fructose malabsorption. And, 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 and the other uh, food intolerances like uh, casein and, and so on. So we look at the global picture and I'm told uh, today that in, in the thousand patients I've seen, there are only three that we couldn't explain uh, a food problem. In 997, there was something, even it was sucralose. No? In 950, it's the, the big four we call them. No? It's, uh, lact lactose, fructose, um, wheat and what's the, the fourth one? Um, casein. Okay, so the, the, the big four we call them. And then you go for a smaller group where there are disaccharide deficiencies, uh, like sucralose, <coughs> sucralase deficiency. <coughs> but so if you if you then look further, there, there are only three people in the nine in the thousand that we didn't find anything. But maybe it's something rare. How would you determine the person has a disaccharide? You, you do, um, you do a sucralose antibody test. It's high. Do you, sure. do you think that low dose naltrexone has got any connection with this? It has, sim it has uh, symptomatic effects. It, it, it changes a number of symptoms of, of brain related uh, toxicity. But um, naltrexone is dangerous. Now I'll, I'll tell you why. If you block uh, endorphins, that was my thesis. I did my PhD thesis on that. Uh, if you block endorphins when you're exercising, you go into depression. Mm -hmm. uh, two of my, I did a study with ten medical students who were also triathletes. They were all friends. They were in one group. So I took them. We gave them. Uh, two milligrams of naloxone, it works only 45 minutes, or, um, or placebo, and we made them cycle on the exercise bike, and so uh, all of them that got uh, the uh, naloxone went into depression immediately after the exercise test, and two wanted to jump from the seventh floor, really. They started crying, and, and they became really aggressive, and so on. So I don't think this is without risk. I, mean, so, so I had to go explain to the ethics committee what I did. I didn't know. I was completely surprised. But, but it's true. I mean, this, these things happen. And, and I'm not happy with the, I think, a Scottish group that's, that's doing this research. That they, well, people, people are going to be feeling less symptoms, be more active. I mean, what's going to happen? This, they have not published about the relationship with, with depression. And naltroxone has a much longer action than naloxone. Naloxone is, is finished after 45 minutes, there's no more action. But if you if you give naltrexone, that has an action of hours, four, five, six hours. So it's, it's completely different. What is the strength of the naltrexone tablets that are commonly available in Europe? I don't know. No. So in Australia and America, since 1984 when it was accepted by the FDA, it's been 50 milligrams. Yeah. And 50 milligrams blocks your endorphins for 24 hours and causes um, very uncomfortable central nervous system and gut side effects. Yeah. Um, but now we're talking about three to four and a half milligrams, which is said to only block the endorphins for three or four hours. Yeah, I mean, but again, um, I've not seen the side effect profile uh, of this. 